1985. What's over two decades you've been set there. As years. somebody, I, I believe, I read somewhere that you actually calculated it to some figure like 7,904 days. <laughs> you, you read it right. Uh, you you know, actually do, you know, do you know the Constitutional Court down the bottom there, mm -hmm. those marble stones? One for each of the Ravonia tribes and a couple of other people. There's a stone for me there. We disagree about that <laughs> because they're not including the awaiting trial period, a 90-day detention, as though it's not prison. From the day I was arrested to the day I was released, that's my calculation. Man, I should have stayed longer. I should have made 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's the defense against that? What's the defense? You have to laugh at yourself. You have to, I mean, how do you imagine? I mean, I talk to high school kids, they're 18. And I say, well, I was in prison 22 years. And they say, what? Go to Sweden and talk. They say, were you never allowed weekend leave at home? <laughs> but it's in the past now, and I mean, I'm part of something much bigger than that. The day I was out of prison, 22 years, a friend phoned me from Germany to say happy birthday, because you were reborn on this day, <laughs> February 28th, 1985. <laughs> Explain the conditional release. How did, what was your thinking? You know, how did that happen? You know, um, I heard from a visitor that there were negotiations. There's talk of your release and it's genuine. Worse to that effect. I knew that my daughter, who was on a kibbutz in Israel, was trying to do something. The exact detail I don't know. And then Christmas of 1984, the chief medical attendant uh, comes to me. He says, I'm supposed to have a prostate operation. He says, don't have it. I said, why? He says, well, just don't have it now. I said, you've got to give me an explanation. He says, well, you're young enough to make babies if you want to when you get released. I got life, I'm not getting released. And he goes on and on and on to say, don't have it, you can have it later if you need to. Then three or four prison guards come into my cell and they start taking out everything. Uh, I was a model prisoner, everything neat and chick chuck military style, you know. <laughs> and the guy says to me, Sergeant, he says, hey, the way you look after your things, no woman will live with you when you're outside. And he's hinting, I'm going out. And they keep doing this to me. And then a guy turns up from my daughter's kibbutz in Israel. He's been asked to negotiate my release. And uh, very difficult because they've offered Nelson his release, if you remember. Uh, and then Helen Sisman in Parliament said, we'll extend it to the others. And she came to see me with Adrian Flock, the minister to convince me to accept release. And I can see the doors opening. Um, and then comes the conditionality that you will not take part in armed activity, violent activity for political ends. Um, you won't break the law. And I agonize over this. And then make the decision, A, that what I say under duress for my release, I can deny it afterwards and say, what would you do if you offered release uh, and you can go out and be active? And that was the point, to be politically active. Or I can simply say, 
I'm going to be politically active. I'm 52 years old. Am I going to go back into Encanto West Eastway or be a political activist? Uh, and I, that's what I decided to do. I knew it would be difficult, but I'd come to a point where I had to make the decision. Had they said, you have to apologize for being taking part in Encanto and violent activity, I would have said, no, I can't do that, because I believe that the armed struggle was right. And I came out of prison. Uh, they said there was no condition that I leave the country. My daughter and whole family were abroad. And I knew that if I stayed inside South Africa, anybody I had contact with, I'd be like what the Portuguese intelligence called a lighthouse. You illuminate the next activist. There was no way I could be active inside South Africa. And that was the point, to accept it to be active. So I fly to Israel to meet my daughter. And then there's the question, do I fly South African Airways or El Al? If it's South African Airways, I'm on South African territory. The captain has a South African and has jurisdiction. Are there going to be somebody on, is there going to be somebody on the plane who would kill me? Poison me, something. I don't know. Maybe I'm paranoid. Maybe they were out to get me. I don't know. So I chose to fly with El Al to mo join my daughter and then go on to London. I know that the leadership of the ANC has negotiated my release. I know that for a fact. But they were not saying anything. Because there are things you can do behind the scenes that you can't do publicly, not for the government or for the ANC. There'd be too many shouts and cries. It's the start of a process, and I was the first of that process. If the, uh, my leadership wouldn't agree to speak out, then I could not. I simply had to swallow it and take the uh, negativity of some of my comrades. But Tarbo and Becky, as right-hand man to Oliver Tambo, chaired a meeting where I was presented to the world's press in Lusaka. Dennis Goldberg is our comrade and he's back and he's a member and this is what he's going to be doing as spokesman in London, in the ANC office. And I presented, my handwritten letter was typed up and issued to the world's press. So why should I feel embarrassed, except for the stupidity of some of my comrades? who always looked for ways of creating divisions and not unity. <laughs> and then I was told, ANC office in London is torn apart with factions. Don't work there. And I said, well, if that's the case, I have to work there to try to overcome it. So that's what I did.